Welcome to PT Podcast with Eric, edition number 16. So this week's edition, we're going to be looking at different training environments. And it's now the time of year in spring and we're moving into summer soon. And people are starting to either return to their old training routines and habits or, or testing some new things. And also those people who for the first time are deciding to make a change in their lives and move into some form of exercise or training program. So this week's podcast is mainly looking at, well, what are the different types of training environments that you may choose to uh, embark? Um, how can you leverage ones that you're currently doing? And how do you move forward in making real change in your lives uh, through an exercise platform? Uh, there are a lot of pro- pros and cons, I-, I suppose, to a lot of these uh, different training environments. And it's not a one-size-fits-all. So different training environments will be based on people's, um, uh, I suppose, cash flow is usually a, a big one, uh, time, availability, uh, interests, um, and also physically what they can and cannot do and, um, and where they are in terms of their training age and, and uh, if they have injuries and so on. Also, if we've got um, you know, work and home life commitments and do we have time or the ability to train on your own independently or do you need to train in the company of your children or, or your spouse and so on. So these are the type of things we can, uh, you know, really look into today's podcast. So let's start with um, the the one that I know extremely well because I've been doing it for 20 years, and that's the traditional gym scene. So so the gymnasium, um, what you find in a gym, you've got your pin loaded, plate loaded uh, type of equipment, then you've got your free weights and functional movement as well as your cardiovascular equipment as well. Um, the, the main things you need to look for when you're looking at a gym, depending on what your goals are, uh, well, does the equipment satisfy your needs? So, for example, um, the, the first thing I would look for when I go into a gym to know who actually designed this gym is bas- basically the, the weights of the dumbbells. So, uh, if I know that the weights are only go to a certain weight, then I know what type of uh, clientele that that gymnasium is looking for. So, anything from 40 kilos and under, they're going for a more fitness clientele. Anything where the weights go 40 and up, then I know they're looking for a bodybuilding market. So, that is the first sign or a symptom that you can tell whether that gymnasium is for you if you're a traditional bodybuilder. Uh, The other thing that is very important to look for in gymnasiums is the placement of equipment. Uh, One thing that really gets to me is when uh, someone has not designed a gym properly and they put equipment in front of mirrors, but then the way it's designed is that there's another piece of equipment in front of it or they know it's a high traffic area where people will stand in front of you. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys really would understand that type of thing, but if you're a, a, a very um, committed bodybuilder, that is a very uh, disturbing thing to have and you can't really focus and, and look at the muscle fibers and so on. And the other thing I look for in a gymnasium is the hamstring curl machine. You will tend to find in some of these high-end corporate uh, gymnasiums, you will not find that piece of equipment. What they will do is they have a a seated uh, uh, hamstring curl. And that does not hit the muscle fibers. Actually, I don't recommend that exercise at all because of the amount of pressure it puts behind the knee. Um, So these are the things that I would look for when I look for a uh, gymnasium. Now, a lot of people may look for different things. So they may look for the functional training equipment. Uh, Does it have synthetic grass that allows you to train without any shoes on? Um, But then that could be also a health hazard as well. Um, Ventilation is a big thing for gymnasiums. So you have to take into account a lot of these 24-hour gyms. Do they have have sufficient um, uh, air conditioning during summer and during winter as well. Um, the, the other thing to look for is the, the type of uh, cardiovascular equipment. Now you hope it's all commercial equipment rather than semi-commercial and is it robust and, and is it up to date and, and so on. Uh, believe it or not, some of the old cardiovascular equipment I believe is, is the better one uh, or are the, are the better ones as opposed to some of the new stuff in terms of how quickly you can change the, um, the pace or the gradient of, of your treadmill and so on, uh, especially if you're running. Um, the, the things I look for in a gymnasium as well is the the busiest time period. So when that, that 4.30, 5.30 session through to 7.30, when it's the peak period of a gymnasium, what does it actually look like? Um, do you actually have access to um, the equipment or do you have to wait? Or is there enough equipment in that space that allows you to um, move from place to place? Uh, they, these are the things I would look for. 
The other thing I would look for in a gymnasium are what are the services provided? So do you go there specifically for um, you know, directed and supervised uh, instruction for the exercises you want to do? So for example, um, do they have spin classes? Do they have uh, yoga classes, um, you know, uh, freestyle classes? Uh, and, and those type of um, uh, classrooms allow you to feel like you're being directed but um, also have some empowerment and that's in the sense that you want to you know take control of what you're doing as well because you've got an instructor on the floor just looking and and supervising you so that is another way that's a good transition way of uh, going into um, a, a training program so when you're looking at the type of uh, equipment so let's say we stick with uh, pin loaded and plate loaded of equipment so a, a, a novice going into the gym would definitely use pin-loaded equipment. And, and the way that the gym equipment is generally placed, and it should be placed this way, is it forms a type of circuit between lower limb, upper limb, um, you know, your torso, and so on. So these are the things that I would look for in a gymnasium. Um, the reason why I recommend that you should start at um, pin-loaded equipment is basically because your back and your torso is being supported. That's really fundamentally the purpose of this equipment. Um, then when you start to move into the plate-loaded equipment, it still has that support, but you can have some um, exercises that allow you to focus on um, the trunk of your body without being resting or allowing it to rest on some back rest or a, a, a breastplate type of uh, support. And then you would move into your free weight equipment. So um, there is a progression and I would probably follow that. And then you do a com combination of all three and, and you can include your functional equipment as well. So when you're looking at free weights, um, whether it's a barbell, dumbbells, kettlebells, uh, slam balls, um, these type of things, anything with a resistance really or a load that you can use, uh, you would do it in a way that you feel confident in using your lumbopelvic region um, and good posture, head and neck alignment and so on. Um, that is something that I recommend when you're either training with a friend who can double check your form or if you do have a trainer that can supervise you or you've been uh, given or taken through a, an exercise program and then you can go mimic it on your own or double check with your trainer every now and again. So these are the things that uh, I highly recommend for a gymnasium. Um, I, I would even go with the, the, the week trial, um, or you might get a fortnightly trial. Uh, I highly recommend that because then you can get a feel of the culture of the place and, and sort of the ethos. And, and does it support what you want to achieve? Um, and there's so many gyms on the market now. There's so much noise on the market. Um, you have a lot of opportunity to sort of um, decide what you want to do. Uh, gym memberships are something you need to consider as well. Um, you know, there are ombudsmans out there that um, do take note and, and really look at um, the way um, gym memberships are, um, are, are prescribed these days. And you do have a, an exit clause and you have to read the fine print because it may be six months or a 12 month, a 12 month uh, contract to start off with and so on. Um, but you can negotiate these things as well. So as you can see, I've just rolled out so many different things. Now, it's only because I've been in the industry for 20 years, um, these things will come very quickly and naturally to me. But um, for someone just starting out, I would probably listen to this podcast again and just write some of these notes of things that you could um, ask um, the staff or look out for when you go doing your trial and then decide what you want to do. Um, that, that's for the gymnasium environment. Another training environment that you may consider is uh, boot camps and outdoor fitness uh, training environments. So if you're someone that uh, lives inside an office um, or is a desk jockey, then the outdoor environment is always an exciting area because, you know, it's green, it's healthy, um, you get some fresh air and so on. Uh, a lot of pros and cons, though, when we look at the outdoor training environment. Uh, when I was an outdoor instructor, um, the, the things is to, or the things you can look at is, you know, are there enough equipment sufficient to what you need to do um, or based on the, the training group that you have? Um, you might go a bit more intimate with small groups or you may get really large groups for outdoor fitness. So you need to see where you feel comfortable. Uh, but they are a great opportunity for people to meet other people. Um, 
if you want to do it from a social perspective and you can get outside and sort of be in a relaxed environment um, and you can sort of laugh about things when you know it gets really tough and so on uh, outdoor training environments are great for teamwork and, and small group activities as well so if it's something that you really thrive on or you want to improve your skills on um, it is great and that's why um, that boot camp environment is great for corporates as well because you get to sort of you know be outside and rough it up a bit um, Temperature is a huge thing when we're looking at outdoor fitness. So first thing in the morning, got to be careful because of the dew. Um, and then later in the evenings, it also gets cool and there's dew as well. But then you have to look at the extreme temperatures of the heat. Um, and there is a duty of care for personal trainers to consider that as well. Um, and a lot of these uh, outdoor facilities won't provide uh, water, so you have to bring that, plus sunscreen and so on. So you do have a lot of um, responsibility for yourself that you have to take care when you're you're participating in, in outdoor environments um, usually an outdoor training environment has a lot of running involved so if you're not very good at running or you have some um, uh, injuries and issues I think you need to think twice about um, that as well um, also a lot of training environments outdoors don't really use much gym equipment okay um, they, they won't take many dumbbells or barbells with them so it tends to be body weight based exercise and I think you need to uh, consider that okay but um, outdoor fitness is great once again for the group training environment get some fresh air um, got to consider the the pros and cons associated with temperature because some people love that stuff um, and and that is okay but then you know if it's raining as well is a person going to cancel and then there's um you know gym uh, then there's also the membership program that you may have to um, then make up for that session and so on um and also then there's council um, issues as well so you got to make sure that the trainer is um uh, has that level of cover with insurance um so a few things to consider there. But outdoor training environment, I, I did it for many, many years, loved it. The community of people that you have um, creates a really good bond and, and I've kept friends with a, a lot of them. And that's uh, something to, um, to look for when you're in a training environment. And they usually give free sessions as well. Um, you can even go check them, check them out during the session and you don't have to participate so you can see from afar. And then it gives you a good idea of the, you know, the camaraderie and people actually get along with themselves uh, with outdoor training environments it can be the beach can be grass environments can be hill based environments so there's a lot of different terrain that you can use um, regardless of the terrain you have to look at the lighting lighting is so important during daylight saving it's fine but then during the you know the darker months um, you need to make sure that there is enough um, uh, light that gets these areas and the other thing I, I always consider and look for as a trainer is the terrain in the sense of are there a lot of divots um, uh, are there sharps in the area um, based on where the parking is can you get in and out and so on um, so there, there's actually a lot more to consider uh, in the outdoor training environment there is from a gymnasium environment because of the uh, control versus uncontrolled environment um, but regardless a lot of people love it and they work in teams and it's good fun the next one I'd like to uh, have a chat about is regarding uh, cross training and cross fit based uh, gym environments okay I think there's been a lot of controversy over the the different types of um, outdoor slash indoor based environments and they're usually taking place within a warehouse okay so um, we need to really take great care as to the difference between the two because a CrossFit based environment is a CrossFit affiliate okay so these these boxes at which they call them um, are really gymnasiums in the sense that they do pay affiliate fees okay so you need to be very clear that that um, warehouse based environment is it CrossFit or not? Because if it is not, and they have wall balls and they have rigs and things like that, and they have things such as wads and AMRAPs, then they're actually breaching um, 
the affiliate or, or, or the rights that CrossFit have worked very hard and paid a lot of money to own. So you need to be very clear that in the training environment that you're going to, that it is sort of a legitimate um, uh, box in that sense. If they are doing cross training, that's different. That's okay and it could be in circuits and so on. But um, the main thing I would look for is basically the terminology um, that they would use on their website, um, the way they, they organize the exercises and the, and the program and so on. Because um, there should be a great distinction between the two. Okay, so if it is a CrossFit environment, um, there are so many different means uh, within CrossFit, okay, in terms of it being a sport. Um, it's quite a competitive environment. So if you're not that type of person, um, you like training in your own sort of um, space and you don't like to feel too intimidated about the person next to you who's pushing just as hard, um, then sometimes the CrossFit environment's not for you. Um, also, ventilation is a big thing with the CrossFit because there's rubber flooring throughout the whole space. Um, it may not be the, the, the scene for you in terms of these, these boxes or warehouses get very hot. Okay, so the main thing I look for when I go into a CrossFit box is the uh, circulation of air uh, based on the fans and the placement of fans. Um, they should be based in a way that allows um, you know, air from one area and then out through the, the roller doors and so on. Um, CrossFit is becoming a lot more competitive these days. So the main thing I would look for are the systems and services that they provide. Um, you know, the programming is a very big, 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 big component to this stuff, okay? Um, and, and that is true. That's what distinguishes a lot of these boxes these days along with the equipment, okay? Um, what you'll find from box to box are the different culture and and that is an amazing thing to experience so they all have you know common goals and things like that but when you go from one box to the next you really feel the difference in the culture um, whether it's based on uh, individual performance uh, elite performance um, everyday fitness based performance encouragement um, of all different levels and that's a great thing about CrossFit they, they've created this this means of sociocracy where you are independent yet collectively work together and, and they do a lot of teamwork based and, and team based um, exercise which is really nice um, CrossFit's an interesting one because they changed the culture of the way we exercise and program these days and I and I think for the better they have influenced the way we we train in gyms in the sense that a lot of the times it's not necessarily to repetitions it could be to time and then based on time um, and how many reps did you complete within that okay and then you work backwards so um, it could be a collective thing of how many reps rather than you know your six sets times five reps that is common amongst um, you know the the traditional gym training environment um, a lot of CrossFit is based on fundamentals so that's one thing I really like is that they have a, a system in the sense they have introductory fundamentals and then they move out to um, sort of the functional training and then they move into um, more strength based exercise uh, CrossFit is very good in the sense that it focuses also on mobility and flexibility. Um, you do have a self-responsibility to get in early and do that type of stuff pre and post uh, training, but it is highly encouraged. So therefore, you sort of don't really have a say. You, you, you tend to just do it anyway. Um, so CrossFit's great, has lots of pros. Um, the cons are that sometimes you push a little bit harder outside of what you're capable of. Um, sometimes the ratio between trainers to how many participants there are can be um, quite minimal uh, and therefore you can sometimes be lost within the system. So you need to be quite a, an overt person and say, hey, I need help and so on. Um, I think that's really important. But the, the thing is the culture is there that someone sitting next to you or training next to you is more than happy to help you or a trainer, if you ask them, they are more than than help you to and uh, more than happy to help you out um, I, I think these are um, some of the the really cool pros uh, to do with CrossFit um, I've seen amazing results uh, one thing I do recommend if you are a beginner you must do fundamentals you must build that that pro pro reception that balance and stability and that trunk before you move into a strength-based program and then 
before you move into um, sort of a power and your, your agile base exercise. I've seen this way too many times. Too many people are getting injured in that sense um, because they try and fast track it and their training age is way too young and, and, and only at level one and they're trying to move into you know strength and functionality combined, which can be very, very dangerous. Um, so if you are observant to these things, then you can really have fun and they, they're really big on the social aspect, uh, which is a really nice um, push within the fitness industry. And um, so these are the reasons why I would highlight or um, promote CrossFit. So that concludes PT Podcast with Eric, edition number 16. Uh, we covered a, a few different uh, training environments that you may uh, start to um, consider in spring and going into summer uh, in your steps towards transforming your body and achieving the goals that you've always wanted to achieve. Um, there are a lot of pros and cons that you need to consider, um, pricing models and things like that, which I didn't go into too much detail. Um, but uh, the main thing I try to get across to you is when you walk into these environments, uh, what are the main things you should be looking for and is it for you um, sometimes training or going with a friend is a great way to uh, trial the environment and see if it does suit you and your friend's needs um, and also once again looking at your time availability um, regarding family and work time and work um, demands and um, whether you want something to push you and, and, and challenge you as opposed to something to slow you down and refocus um, I, I think um, regardless of what you choose to do there are levels from fundamentals through to more advanced and you must be very conscious of these things uh, and be considerate to your training age and where you are um, if it's a transfer of skills to another training program that's good because you can fast track that but if you're um, a novice to the training environment that you need to start at fundamentals and then work your way up from there um, no matter where you choose to go um, these are are the most important things to prevent injury and also to enjoy yourself and have a good time.